Over the years, billions of pounds of fat have been lost by people all over the world. It was done through many different diet systems, keto, intermittent fasting, the zone, Atkins, fill your macros, and so on. And yet, how many of these people have kept the weight off for over a year, for over 10 years? How about 20 years? Yes, the answer is very, very few. In fact, they not only gained all their weight back they lost, they generally gained back even more than they lost. This has been going on for as long as people have been trying to lose weight. Which makes me ask, we blindly follow all these fads and studies that come out, but are these diets safe? Or are they harming us in the long run? Are they even based on science? We are bombarded with diets, studies, and many fads. Even though we have access to more information today than ever before, we're fatter now than we were 50 years ago. Like everyone else, I too have yo-yo dieted all my life. Finally, I got fed up and decided this yo-yo diet craziness has to stop. For a few years now, I have been researching the real, safe, sustainable, and scientific way to lose weight. But not just that, I wanted to know the habits of the people who have lost the weight in such a way they were able to keep it off. You see, I just don't want to lose the fat. I want to do it safely and never gain it back. What is it that these people know that most dieters and experts don't? What are the habits and systems that all these successful people have in common? What I found out is that most of these weight loss programs do not focus on the psychology of it all. They only focus on the weight loss side. You see, first you have to change the mind or you'll never change the body. Well, in my quest, I discovered a large group of people who have done this. They kept the weight off so far for 5, 10, and even 15 years and counting. I believe that my heaviest is around the uh, 320. And uh, how much I've lost, it looks like around 85 pounds of, of fat. Back in 2017, I was a type 2 diabetic. Uh, my fasting glucose was 160. And then within about six months, I got things under control and it was down at a fast of 72. I was very pleased with that. My doctor was pleased. Uh, within six months, they finally took me off metformin, which I've been on it for a couple of years. I uh, kept it off for almost three years now. So I've lost 120 pounds and I have kept it off for about six years now. I was a little over 230 pounds whenever I started. And then I got down to about 105 and the rest I've just kind of gained kind of improved my body. And how hard is it to keep it off? Um, I don't find it hard to keep off. Um, I have one of those minds that when I go, I go. I was 340 pounds, um, severely overweight. I had a waistline of between 44 and 46, wearing double X to triple X shirts. I've lost 135 pounds. I've kept it off for about two to three years. It's been so long, I can't give you an accurate time. But it, this is actually taking no effort now. It, it's effortless now. And through them, I discovered the one person that holds the largest body of work in regards to the psychology of eating management and relapse prevention in America. Over 40 years worth. So I flew across the country to interview him and others that specialize in specific areas of weight loss. And what I found out is the mind-blowing information that all these successful people have in common. Well, let's start cleaning up all the confusion, starting with knowing what's in our food. I mean, we have to know how many calories, how many fat grams, carbs, and stuff like that are in our food so we know what we are putting in our bodies. Back in 1990, the Nutrition, Labeling, and Education Act was passed. It required all food products to put labels on them, including food ingredients, serving size, and terms like low fat and light. Even though things have been added and subtracted and changed over the years, the basic standard has been the same since 1990. It seems like the government is on our side and trying to help us on our journey, right? Well, I discovered that was wrong. The first person I saw was Keith Klein, a certified clinical nutritionist. Keith Klein has been working in the dietetic field for over 40 years and is considered to be the father of eating management. 
He has one of the largest bodies of work on eating management and relapse prevention, which spans hundreds of articles, radio, and TV shows, including his own shows on CBS, KSEV, and BIZ, and nationally syndicated Prime Sports Radio. Mr. Klein was the dietetic director at several prominent medical facilities, like the Institute of Specialized Medicine with psychiatrist Dr. John Sims, and Houston Sports Medicine Clinic, which he owned with Dr. Ron Preston. He has helped thousands of people from famous sports stars, Mr. Olympian athletes, to everyday folks like you and me. He then opened the Institute of Eating Management and Relapse Prevention Center, where he resides to this day. He has written several successful books and created the hit audio series, The Shift. More recently, he has created an online weight loss program that contains his life's work called Lean Body Coaching. I would contend that it's almost impossible for Americans to eat healthy today. And why would I say something like that? Labels are the guidelines by which we have to choose healthy foods. If the guidelines on these labels are misleading and deceitful, how can Americans ever eat healthy food? See, a big problem with having so many deceptive labels out is it causes a lot of people to become somewhat delusional. There's nothing worse than thinking you're doing the right thing only to find out you weren't, only because the labels that you were using were misleading and uh, deceitful. So how many of you would like to reduce the calories in your food, reduce, let's say, maybe the fat, and would go out and eat something like lean ground turkey, and clearly it tells you that it's 7% fat. You know, 7% fat is way under the 20 that I would describe to. A lot of Americans try to eat 30 or 40% fat. I'd say keep it under 20, and clearly that 7% right there on the label tells you that it's a low-fat food. When I turn the label over and I ask almost everybody, can you tell me what the real percentage of fat of this food is? Almost nobody can do it. Do you know that in America, no company by law has to put the actual real percentage of fat on a label? They don't have to do it, so they don't do it. Now, when we look at the back of this label, we can see that the calories are 160 and the grams of fat are eight. One thing I'm gonna need you to memorize is this simple formula. Grams of fat times nine divided by the calories equals the percentage of fat. The reason why we multiply the grams of fat times nine is because one gram of fat has nine calories. So if the grams of fat are eight, 8 times 9 is 72. 72 divided by 160 is literally 45% fat. Do you understand that this food that's labeled lean and claims to be 7% fat is actually 45% fat? In other words, this ground turkey has the exact same percentage of fat as T-bone steak. In other words, if you wouldn't eat T-bone steak to drop body fat, why on earth would you eat this turkey expecting a different outcome when in regards to their fat, they're equivalent? I'm gonna walk you through a couple things you need to understand. When you see this percentage of fat on the label, it refers to the product's fat by weight, not its fat by calories, and those are two completely different things. But do you understand companies deliberately put a low percentage of fat on the label to convince you to buy it? That's a high fat food labeled as a low fat food. And so the word lean simply means that it has under 10 grams of fat in a serving. And as we just saw, this food has under 10 grams of fat in a serving, but it's a high fat food. So if you're just looking at grams of fat, you're missing the whole boat. We really need to look at the percentage. And my question becomes this, why wouldn't the company just put the actual percentage of fat on the label? It's because they don't want you to know it. Now, notice something. When you look at this label here, they didn't even bother to tell you what they ground up because they don't have to. This could be the thigh meat or wing meat. It could be the scrap meat. This, you'll never know, okay? What you have to look at, don't look at the words like extra lean and all that stuff. You have to look for the word breast within the title of the product. If it doesn't say the word breast, it's not, okay? So you're probably getting scammed. But the most important thing to do, once again, is to go to the back, look at the label. In this case, one and a half times nine is 13. 13 divided into the 120 is 11% fat. And that's a great food to me because it's under 20%. So if I'm gonna make turkey burgers, turkey meatloaf, turkey chili, I wanna be making it out of this because it says breast, not because it says extra lean. Because the word extra lean simply means by law that it has five grams of fat or less in a serving. And as you're gonna see, there are a lot of foods that have less than five grams of fat that are phenomenally high fat foods. Now check this out, okay? All of them are the same brand, but suddenly notice this one's telling me it's made from all white meat. Now, because it has above 10 grams of fat, it can't use the word lean. 
Uh, because it isn't as low as five grams of fat or less, it can't use the term extra lean. So this tells you right now, this is even higher in fat than the 45% because it can't use any one of those terms. The term all white meat, you do realize the wing meat is white, right? And you realize the wing meat and the thigh meat are 58% fat. They're higher in fat even than most cuts of red meat. So if you're eating the thigh meat and wing meat of poultry, you're eating just as high in fat as beef. You might as well be eating the beef. So when you see the word lean and 7%, you have to wonder how did those words come to be, right? It's because lobbyists in Washington are paid a vast amount of money to protect the interest of the companies they represent over yours and my health. And I see that as just criminal. These are high fat foods being allowed to be marketed as low fat foods. And I find that to be very misleading and highly deceitful. I also saw Dr. Roxanne Edrington. She is a doctor of chiropractic, a clinical nutritionist, naturopathic practitioner. She's certified in functional medicine and in applied kinesiology. She is a healthy lifestyle coach, public speaker, athlete, and author. She is the CEO and creator of Ultimate Vitality, a vitality program designed to enhance health and vitality through balanced nutrition and lifestyle choices. She is also the author of the successful book, Don't Feed the Sugar Monster, a book that teaches children about good nutrition and lifestyle. Defying the odds, she is an American Ninja Warrior in her 50s and a champion bodybuilder. She also has been featured on ABC, CBS, ESPN, PBS, and NBC. So one of the big problems I see um, with my patients and other people is that the companies, the food companies, are mislabeling their products. Um, I don't know how many times I've talked to people about lean meat, you know, and I actually had to start bringing the labels into my office because they were like, no, it's lean. And so I had to show them how to read labels. So that's where it gets real confusing. So the dairy companies and the meat companies are really the worst. And because consumers aren't educated, they keep believing it. If it says lean, if it says, you know, low fat, healthy, which they see all over the labels, um, that is the issue. And people are getting sucked into it. And they're the reasons, one of the big reasons why people still are having problems losing weight, even though they're really trying to make a difference. And how they get away with that is because those companies know that we're fat gram seekers and we're looking for fats. And doctors are telling patients, you need to watch your fat intake. So try to eat foods that are 20% fat or less. And so they're reading these labels, believing them. Turkey bacon is the biggest one I see all the time. They're like, oh, it's lean. But when you actually look at the label, they're finding out that they've been misinformed. Um, and how they get away with that is because what they're doing is they're measuring it by weight not by calories. We don't eat by weight. Who eats by weight? We eat by calories. But look, if you were to buy tuna and you wanted to lose weight, would you buy it in water or oil? Now, if you're like most people, you'd say in water. Now, let's be clear, oil-packed tuna is 33% fat. In my world, I consider anything above 20 to be a little bit uh, too high. But look, this is clearly telling me it's in spring water. It's telling me it's premium albacore. It gives me the name of the brand. And when I turn it over, one gram of fat times nine is nine, divided by 70, this tuna fish is about 13% fat. And, and this is a good choice in regards to its percentage of fat, and most people would never look at the label again. Now, I want you to notice these two labels are absolutely identical. They're both in spring water, but they both say the same brand. They're both premium albacore. When you turn it over to the nutrition facts panel, you see suddenly that they are different. Instead of one gram of fat in a serving, this one has five. Now, five times nine is 45. It's the exact same food, but the calories are no longer 70, they're 110. So now we do 45 divided by 110, and that tells you that this water-packed tuna is 45% fat, or 40, actually. So look, how many people in America do you think know that water-packed tuna is always higher in fat than oil every November through March? This represents the different times of year they catch the fish because these fish migrate, they quadruple their weight in fat. And so every migratory season, water-packed tuna is actually higher in fat or can be higher in fat than oil-packed. So if oil-packed tuna is 33% fat and I wouldn't eat that to get lean, why would I eat it in water if it's higher in fat than oil expecting a different outcome? So you see, I think consumers need to be aware the labeling laws are not worked in your favor. They actually are designed to work against you to help these manufacturers sell their products. Now, I should stress, both cans will be on the shelf at the same time. It's just up for you to notice. So again, that formula becomes critical once again if we're really going to determine whether the fit, food fits into our program or your program or whoever's program. 
Larry North is a fitness pioneer and icon. In 1981, he started his first business at age 20. His media career started shortly after that by arriving on talk radio, where he has performed for over 25 years. Shortly after that, his best-selling infomercial became one of the most popular weight loss infomercials ever. Because of his three best-selling books, a chain of health clubs, and thousands of TV appearances and live presentations, Larry North has become a household name in fitness, weight loss, and health. He continues to spread his motivational messages and wisdom to dozens of Fortune 500 companies and to just about anyone who will listen. The reason people have a hard time with food labels and the deceit from food conglomerates that are gigantic, we're talking a trillion dollar industries, it's because of money. It's because of money. You know, they, they, certainly they know that if they had a, a, if you were able to get an actual visual picture of the things that you were putting in your, in your body uh, versus the deceptive food labeling that they're able to get away with, you wouldn't eat it. You, even someone that, that doesn't care a whole lot would go, whoa, I'm not gonna put that in my body. But they get away with it because it's a money thing. It's a money grab. Okay, so take a look at this typical can of soda. Notice the, on the label it shows you that it has 40 grams of sugar. How many teaspoons of sugar is that anyway? But look, when you see 40 grams of sugar, there's a simple formula that you can use to convert it to teaspoons. And once you do that, you become more aware, right? Because grams doesn't mean much to us as Americans. But let me show you the formula. Simply take the grams of sugar on the label and divide it by four, and that converts it into teaspoons. So let's do the formula. 40 divided by four means this little tiny can of soda has 10 packets of sugar contained within it. I mean, that's nothing but liquid candy. But just to understand, this is going to spike insulin levels, it's going to be converted to triglycerides, it's going to be stored, almost all human body fat is stored in the form of triglycerides, and this food is simply going to be feeding a lot of fat cells. So look, if you're drinking two cans of this soda a day, and there's 10 packets per soda, which means you're drinking 20 packets of sugar every day, times seven days in a week, do you realize you're drinking 140 packets of sugar a week? Now let me just give you a visual on that. I put 140 packets of sugar in here. That's how much sugar you consume by drinking two cans of regular soda a day. This is about a pound and a quarter of sugar that's going into your body. And you see, I think that if our labeling laws were to change and we put that sugar content in teaspoons instead of grams, I think that people would be a lot more leery about what they're doing with their foods. But did you know that in America it's completely legal to sell a food as fat free when it's virtually 100% of its calories are coming from fat? Let me give you an example of one. Okay, so these cooking sprays are great to use. Don't throw them away. I use them. I want you to use them. But this is where I have an issue with the label laws as they are now written. The label laws state, this is nothing but a can of oil. And it works great because you spray it, you use far less than if you try to pour it. So again, when you're trying to reduce calories, these sprays are a wonderful thing to use. I use them in my cooking all the time. But here's the problem. The law states that if in your serving size it has a half a gram of fat or less, you can just say, it has no fat. Now why do I take issue with that? This is a can of oil, it's 100% fat, in other words, 100% of its calories come from fat. They are showing me on the label that it has no calories, and no calories are coming from fat. In fact, there's no grams of fat, it's all zero. So based on what I'm reading, there's no fat, so I should be able to use as much of this as I want and get no calories and no fat. This is telling me a serving size is a third of a second spray. I, I don't even think I could do that, right? And nobody is using a third of a second spray. Why won't I just hold down the button for minutes if I wanted because there's no calories or fat? But this is a, literally an example of a food that's labeled fat free that's actually 100% fat. Now, where that gets to become a problem is this says zero calories right on the label and zero grams of fat. If it has no calories and no fat, why wouldn't I just uncap it and pour it on my baked potato and chicken breast, right? But this container has 900 calories of which virtually almost all of its calories are coming from fat. So once again, what we need to do is get the label laws straight if people in America are ever gonna be healthy and fit. Because if these labels are deceitful and misleading, how are we gonna choose healthy foods? I just simply believe if this food's 100%, if all of its calories are coming from fat, just say it is. Besides food labels, another thing that gets confusing are all these scientific studies. 
One study says this is good for you. Another study will say that's bad for you. Over the years, the studies have gone back and forth so much. Who do we listen to? How do we discern which one is true and which one is false? Some studies will say something is good for you, and then there'll be some other studies that say it's not good for you. So really we have to think what, who is asking or who is talking about the study. Because if the study is going to help someone, it's very convenient for them to pull out key points. Resveratrol is healthy, therefore resveratrol is in wine. Therefore you need to drink wine to get the resveratrol because then that could be anti-aging and anti-cancerous. But I could find a study that could say wine has a lot of sugar in it. If you consume wine, you're gonna raise your blood sugar. Raising your blood sugar creates inflammation. Inflammation can create obesity and other chronic illnesses. So one little thing, depending on how you're looking at it and depending on who's using that study, is gonna make a big difference. So it's, it all goes back to the reason the person's putting the study out and, and what point are they trying to get consumers to fall for if it benefits them. Food manufacturers discovered that when they can come up with a study to support their product, their food, or their industry, that that one study can lead to a billion dollar industry. I mean, think back about Oat Bran back in the 90s, maybe it was the late 80s. Oat Bran appeared on everything because a study came out and said that Oat Bran reduced your cholesterol. You know, the truth is all fibers reduce your cholesterol, so to isolate oatmeal as kind of being the thing to eat more of to drop your cholesterol level might be some okay advice, but I don't think it's what people really need to hear. Studies can be what I call equivocal. So for every research that you show me that says a vitamin does this, I'll find one that says it doesn't. Now the goal of the scientific community is over the course of time to tip the balances heavily in one direction or another. So I think over time, we can say, yeah, this supplement does this or that thing does that. And I would contend that the vast majority of these food-based studies that we have coming out today, a lot of them are just not accurate. You really have to look at who's behind them. And so once again, give these studies time to kind of over the course of time let you know what's real and not. Just don't react and respond to a current study. I think if you're doing that, you're going to be responding and reacting to things all the time. Kurt Osborne is an endurance athlete and fitness junkie. He is a two-time Guinness World Record holder. He is the first person to wheelie across America with a total of 2,900 miles. He rode from the Santa Monica Pier to the Cocoa Beach Pier in Florida. He first made the record at age 29 and just recently broke his own record at age 49 with a faster time, which goes to show you that age is just a number. If anybody knows about testing the limits of the body and the mind, it's Kurt. You know, it's frustrating because I, I understand, I could see why people get upset and, and, and get discouraged because there's so, the, I think the biggest problem is there's almost too much information and you're just being fed through this master pipeline of all this stuff and you're trying to like, whoa, whoa, which way, which way do I go? Which way do I, you know, what do I read? You know, and I'm not here, you know, like I said, once again, I'm not a fitness guru, I'm not a nutritionist, doctor, scientist, I'm just an average guy, okay, but I figured it out on my own by reading, and, and, and you got to question things, and continue to read, okay, knowledge is power, you know, I mean, it's, it's that simple. Now we come to the mother of all confusion, fad diets. It seems like every week a new diet comes out or a new craze. You got keto, intermittent fasting, juicing, super low calorie or the HMR diet. And let's not forget the infamous bacon diet. And even once we had the cabbage soup diet. I actually tried that once. We've all seen these great before and after photos. So these diets must work, right? Or do they? The reality about all these different diets is they're just simply not sustainable. I mean, the reality is that whatever you do to lose weight is what you're going to have to keep doing to keep it off. So let me get this straight. You're going to go no carb, you're going to go keto or whatever. What you're saying to me is, I plan on never eating a potato again. I don't ever plan on eating rice again. And that's why simply put, diets don't work. They're a temporary fix. They're not a long-term solution. But consider this for a moment. How many people will start a diet by giving up all their favorite foods, like no more red meat, no more fried food, uh, no more eating out? They're gonna do great for a couple of weeks, right? But listen, it's been estimated that for every 10 pounds you lose on a really strict diet, 
four, at least four of it can come out of muscle. If we look at this chart, we see this lady's about 120 pounds, she's 25% body fat, she's completely normal. Now, she overeats for whatever reason, and let's just say she gains 20 pounds. That fat sits on top of the fat she had before she gained it. Now, let's just say that she's at 140, and she wants to do whatever it takes to get the weight off fast. So what she's gonna do right now is she's gonna undereat. She's gonna cut out her carbs. She's gonna eat a really low calorie diet in an effort to lose the weight fast. But listen, if her eating is not sufficient to sustain her muscle, then while she's losing weight, some of it's coming out of fat and some of it's coming out of muscle. Now she's not gonna notice any of this is happening to her, right? So at the end of the day, what happens is she hops up on a scale, she loses 20 pounds, the scale tells her she was successful, but let me ask you something. Was she really successful? So as you can see in this chart, she's kept some fat from the last diet, right? And she's lost some muscle. So when she gets back down to 120 and goes to diet again, she's actually fatter at this 120 than she was last time she was 120. Now look, if I time span a period of say eight years or 10 years of this unorthodox on a diet, off a diet, if we could get her back down to 120, she'd no longer be 25% body fat, she would now be 40. You see, because every time she's dieting, she's retaining some fat while she's losing some muscle. And what that means now is her metabolic rate slowed down. You know, if she eats the same number of calories she used to at 120, this girl's gaining 10 pounds a year every year thereafter just by eating the same amount of food. And again, it comes back to that thing. Well, a lot of people say, well, if she just exercised, she would have kept the muscle. And I'd say, no, if she wasn't eating enough to sustain her muscle as it was, and she's working out, she's actually burning more muscle. And so you see at the end of the day, so many of these diets aren't really sustaining your muscle. A lot of them are gonna cause you to lose the muscle. Now what happens is your metabolic rate slows down, eat the same amount you used to, and suddenly you're getting heavier. And I think the big problem with so many diets is you ultimately become a hope seeker. And, and so what's happening now? She's going on to the next diet, the next diet. You know, all this craziness has to stop, and it really has to begin with a sustainable way of eating that you know that you could do the rest of your life. Well, anytime you, you go on a diet, I believe fundamentally they don't work. If you're gonna end up losing lean muscle tissue, you're gonna end up losing your ability to burn fat efficiently. I mean, it's pretty much that simple. Uh, and, and, and so it's a vicious cycle. So if there's a, a, a dieter that were to go to extreme dieting or extreme exercise coupled with extreme dieting, and let's say they lose you know, a pretty sizable amount of weight, their rebound is so severe that they gain that weight back. And typically most times they're, they're actually a fatter version of the same weight because of the loss of lean muscle and that cycle just repeating and repeating itself over, over sometimes over a generation. Mike Ryan is a celebrity trainer, fitness model, and bodybuilder. When Hollywood A-listers want to chisel their body for an upcoming role, they call Mike. Over the years, he has been featured on many bodybuilding magazines and is the go-to guy if you want to build a strong, muscular physique. He also managed and is the ambassador for the Mecca of Bodybuilding, Gold's Gym, Venice, California. Mike is living proof that you can have a muscular, ripped body after 50 or at any age. I think all these diets, though they're good in the beginning, over a long time, I think they're very damaging. And, and diets, are, diets are what they are. I mean, what is a, what is a diet? Diet is a short term to get your body to uh, respond. When you look at all these success stories, you know what I mean, whatever, it's Biggest lose, whatever. You take these people and they put them in a perfect environment, you deny them foods, of course they're going to lose weight. What happens a month from now, a year from now, five years from now? That's why fad diets don't work because there's no patience. People want an immediate response and it doesn't work that way. All these diets seem to work. Many people do lose weight initially. But the problem long term, I have not seen a lot of people be successful on these meal plans or these diets. And the reason why one keto, I mean, okay, the first time you decide to have an adult beverage or the first time you decide to have a little bite of maybe that potato or that pasta your friend is having, or it's somebody's birthday and you just can't stand it, or you go to Mexican food and you think you could just have the fajitas, but people are doing margaritas and there's that chips and salsa. I mean, 
that is pretty hard and many people are failing at that diet just because of that. It's really hard long term and who wants to live like that? I mean, that's a hard way to, to live the rest of your life. And then uh, every day I hear about intermittent fasting. But long term, to be doing intermittent fasting, to me, it's just slowing down your metabolism. By not eating, you're not fueling your body, so now your metabolism's shutting down, and now what kind of weight are you losing? Intermittent fasting is actually setting you up to losing muscle, lean muscle mass, which is more metabolically active than the fat in the water. And when people start getting hungry, the first two weeks is probably okay, but once you get hungry, you just all of a sudden set a whole bunch of demons loose, where now you're having cravings, and now you can't even sleep at night without thinking that you need some kind of food. And that in itself is A, not healthy, but B, it's setting you up for failure. You know, one thing I should mention that's highly inflammatory is ketogenic diets and very low carb diets. What happens when you eat no carbs, and remember we hear the word ketoacidosis, right? The human bloodstream can never become acetic. It cannot or you die. So you have what's called the pH base balance of the blood. If it gets too acetic, you die. If it gets too alkaline, you die. So the body has to keep the pH base balance within its normal parameter. Let's just call it a seven. So when you're eating no carbs, what happens is you become more acetic. You start moving into ketoacidosis, and just the word acidosis tells you it's acetic. As the body becomes acetic, the bloodstream cannot let that happen. So what it does, it attempts to buffer the blood by drawing calcium ions out of the bone. And as you're losing bone, you're going to become more osteoporotic later in life. And so what happens under these cases of inflammation is you cause the future risk of more disease, hardening of the arteries, right, higher blood pressure, um, and again, loss of bone. I think what you have going back for many years is what I call fitness fad fraud. A lot of things that would promise you everything and maybe deliver very little. Uh, a better place for me to go is to let you know that I, I grew up with a mom that was a founding member of Overeaters Anonymous. My mom's in her 80s now, but she struggled with weight control issues from the time she was basically a child. And so that was quite a strain because being a boy of 8, 10, 11, 12, back then they didn't even use the word obese, but my mom was definitely obese. And people could be uh, a little insensitive uh, then and even now. And so we'd go to eat somewhere, for example, and someone might say something that wasn't very kind. And people like my mom would do one of two things. They would deaf ear it like they didn't hear it when they obviously heard it, or they would chuckle, oh, it's funny. But the last thing it was was funny. And so she'd hold it in. And then when we get home, though, it, it sat in her heart where the floodgates of emotion would be rather intense. My mom would do things, she'd be afraid to handle fatty meat, so she'd wear rubber gloves, worried that the fat would get into her skin. She would do diets that were three, four, 500 calorie a day. So I'd, I'd witness her starving herself. She'd go to a doctor and he'd prescribe diet pills that were definitely not healthy for my mom. Just like most people, they did like my mom. They inherently believe that calories are bad, an appetite's bad, so what are they gonna do? They're gonna starve themselves or they're gonna cut out entire categories of food in an effort to try to lose weight. And typically, for most of those people, there's such a strong rebound, they don't understand the physiological aspects of what that's doing to their bodies, and in most cases, to their minds too. You know, I've been around since the 70s and I've seen all the gadgets out there. And you know what? They made millions of dollars of selling all these crazy gizmos and people bought it. Once again, it goes back to what I said before. They're looking for the quick fix, okay? They got the this, the add this, the add that, all this nonsense, okay? Where I, and, it's, and it's sad that the American public believes into it and they buy into that nonsense. The bottom line is, can you sustain that diet your whole entire life? Some people can, most people can't. You know, I don't think too many people talk about the dangers of super rapid weight loss. What you discover if you look at the research is you see a lot of very obese people end up losing their gallbladder. And what happens is there is such an inundation of fat cells, you know, or not fat cells, the fat going through the system that it literally destroys the gallbladder. If you're losing fat so quick, so, so quick, and you want to keep losing, losing fat, you're actually damaging what your goal is, what your physique is. You're going you're gonna to lose your muscle. 
you're going to probably dehydrate yourself, you're going to sap all your energy, you're going to definitely take the water out of your body. To burn a pound of fat, you have to burn 3,500 calories. So think about that. People that are trying to lose, let's say, 10 pounds of fat a week, how are they going to do that? 3,500 times 10, 35,000 calories. How are they going to do that in, in seven days? It's just not going to happen. So realistically, people need to realize 3,500 calories a pound a week, that's about 500 calorie deficit a day. So when you really do the math to it, you can understand that working harder is really not going to benefit you more. And, and thinking about it, like anorexics, uh, anorexics are Everyone looks at them, they look like a skeleton, and they say, oh my gosh, they're so thin. But if, when you do the body comp on someone that's anorexic, really, they have 50% fat. I mean, that's almost obese. And the reason why is because, again, their body will only get rid of some fat, and then what goes after that is all lean t muscle tissue. They start burning muscle and holding fat. And that would be a terrible way to try to lose weight. Okay, we've been going through this diet confusion. So now, let's just cut to the chase. What is the healthy, safe, and sustainable way to lose weight? The way I can keep it off, and not yo-yo diet, and gain it all back and more? Well, the answer will shock you. The answer is simple, and it has been around for years. I didn't say it's easy, I said it's simple. And because of that, the diet industry tries to confuse you, just to make money. They can't make money off the truth. And here's the truth. In 40 years, I've watched every diet come and go. I watched the Scarsdale diet come and go, the Pritikin, the Zone, Atkins has come and gone several times. Now it's paleo, then it's keto, then it's, uh, you know, uh, count your macros. The reality of it all, folks, is at the bottom of it, you have to ask yourself, is what you're doing sustainable? Because if it's not, you're not going to be able to keep the weight off. And so what you have to understand is that truly long-term success comes from a change in uh, a lifestyle, right? That you start making more positive food selections in a way that you know is sustainable. But in the world of dieting, it's all about these strong, hard parameters that you can't violate or you fail. But consider the impact of this. Small changes, so long as they're sustainable, create massive results over the course of time. So if you really want to have successful weight loss, what you're going to have to do is make changes to your behaviors, because that's where the real problem begins. Your weight was really never the issue. The issue was your choices and decisions. The point is everyone needs to figure out that this isn't just for six weeks. This isn't just because you're going to a family reunion. This isn't just because you're going to go to some high school reunion. This is a lifestyle change, meaning it is a slower process, but it's a permanent process, and these changes become permanent. So they can't expect to be changing all their lifestyle in three days. They have to be patient with themselves. You're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days, but in the end, it gets easier and easier. Well, you know, if, if the goal is to lose fat while maintaining or increasing in lean muscle, then it's going to be done through food and and exercise. You're going to have to exercise your body properly. You have to eat to feed the muscle. You're going to have to eat to starve the fat. You're going to have to eat and use food, real food, to basically ignite your own body's ability to lose weight properly. Yeah, so ideally in, in your dietary requirements, you, you want to stay away from processed foods. You want to try and get as best foods as possible. Um, just basically how they were made, how food was made. That's, that's how you want to eat it, raw, organic. Those are the best types. I have a saying, if God made it, it's good. If man made it, it's bad. Man processes food, puts it in a box and a can and a bar. That generally your body, I don't see how your body identifies that as food. Real food, I say if it flies, if it runs, if it grows, <laughs> that's real food. And by eating those foods, it has phytonutrients and fiber and all kinds of things in it that as you eat them, um, they're helping your body. Um, it speeds your metabolism, it feeds your cells, and it is probably the best thing for people to do for permanent weight loss and long-term health. So when you eat, it's not just like, as we talked about, or as you heard in, in past, it's you want to eat proteins, carbs, and fats, because 
without one or the other. You don't want spike in your insulin. You don't want drop in your insulin. That's that's what kind of causes your body to go haywire. And that's when you get cravings. That's when your body will, will uh, stop burning the fat that you want to, to burn fat efficiently. So eat meals that are uh, protein, carb, and fat rich. You know, that, that's, that's what your body wants. So a healthy balanced meal is a protein, a carbohydrate, and fibrous carbs, which would be vegetables. Now, the reason why protein is real important to even have with vegetables, because I know many people that just have like a salad or vegetables, but you need to have a protein with it because a protein buffers the response of glucose rising in your system. Everything you eat, whether it's a piece of broccoli or it's rice or vegetables and fruit, everything you eat turns into glucose. Some foods, you know, turn to glucose a little bit quicker, but if you have protein combined with it, that combination of protein and vegetables slows down the glucose in the system. So it drips glucose in your system, preventing that spike that we don't want. And so the combination of food is really critical. You don't want to have your vegetables and then an hour later have your protein. And then maybe, you know, you really need to eat them combined. That is the best way. Look, in my world, the glycemic index of foods is important for diabetics, but it's not really something that we have to pay close attention to for the average person or the person that works out. And the reason is, when they did the glycemic index of foods, they were rating foods based on how fast they break down and enter the system as a sugar. That's very important to know for diabetics. But I think people take the glycemic index and, and try to apply it to everybody. And let me share with you why it doesn't really matter so much in the way that we eat. What I'm proposing is that you always eat a good protein with a good carb and some veggies. The glycemic index rating was based on eating the carbohydrate by itself. However, let's say white bread was the highest on the glycemic index. Do you realize that the moment you spread butter on it, the glycemic index drops very significantly because the fat slows down the entry rate of the flour. So you see, once you get into eating natural wholesome foods with a good protein, a good carb, and a little veggie, the glycemic index is much lower even if you eat a potato because the protein in the veggie slows down the glycemic index or the entry rate of that potato into the bloodstream. The whole premise behind uh, small meals throughout the day is to constantly feed your body. So you don't want to get hungry because when you get hungry, adverse effects happen. Um, you, the fat burning process slows down and sometimes can stop. So you want to constantly feed. Your body's like, it's like an oven. It's like a stove. So you're constantly feeding. You're feeding nutrients. So what it's doing, it's burning fat. You can get your body regulated so much that as you're sleeping, you can burn, you can literally burn fat efficiently, efficiently while you're sleeping. So many people come from this real restricted diet and all of a sudden they're seeing that what? I can eat five times a day, I can eat six times a day, and it, and it scares them. But on the other hand, I do have people that have come to me and they only eat two meals a day, and it might only be a salad. But again, the problem with that is the metabolism. They're eating twice a day and that's it, and they're only eating foods that really don't even charge up the metabolism. This is what I hear all the time. I can't believe I'm not hungry and I'm eating this food and I'm losing weight. I hear that all the time. I mean, I probably hear that 90% of the time with all my patients. The 10% I don't hear is because they're too afraid and they don't do it and then you know, they're not that happy with it. It's, it's sort of like this. I, 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 I want to use a great metaphor that was incredibly memorable in one of my top infomercials of trying to get people to know the importance of using food to eat. And what I did, I was on a cruise ship with my testimonials and my crew and I needed to come up with a way to convince you that you need to eat to lose weight. So you know what I did? We're on the beach, I got my crew, I got my testimonials, I got an audience. I lit two bonfires. I'm talking two bonfires and it was like summertime. I'm sweating and I'm going back and forth and it's, you're only gonna get this once on film and not gonna be able to do this twice. So I've got the two bonfires going. So what happens if I light this bonfire and I keep feeding it wood? What happens? The fire gets hotter, it gets bigger. Guess what, the wood is food, it burns it faster. That's what your metabolism does. So over here, I light a fire, a bonfire, but I ignore it. What do you think is gonna happen? It's gonna eventually smolder and go out. That's what happens to your metabolism when you starve yourself. There's actually something called the thermic effect of food, right? So when you drink a liquid meal, you don't get much thermic effect at all. The thermic effect of food says this, if you eat a quality protein for every 100 calories of chicken breast you eat, your body will have to burn off 20 calories of its own to do the work of breaking it down into individual amino acids, 
restructuring it back into proteins identical to your own body and pulling it back into the system, that requires a lot of work. So actually, that increased your metabolic rate by about 20%. Um, carbohydrates, if they're complex, can increase the metabolic rate by as much as 10%. Again, that means for every 100 calories of a complex carb you eat, your body's going to burn off about 10 of its own to do the work of breaking it down. And fats have the least thermic effect because as all your body has to do is break it down into tiny enough droplets to transport through the intestinal lining. So they kind of increase your metabolic rate by 4%. You want to retain as much as muscle you can. If you can retain more muscle, number one, you can eat more. Eating the right foods, that is. Okay, you can't go out to these fast food joints and just eat all you want. You're still going to get fat. You have to, you, but you can eat more, and it's going to raise your metabolism. So what we're really talking about here is something called nutrient partitioning. I can literally show you that if you eat a combination of foods in this amount, there is no way it can feed a fat cell. In fact, this food can only be partitioned towards muscle and be burned as energy. So let's be clear. Your body can only utilize so many grams of protein, carbs, and fat at one sitting, and also so many calories. If you eat more of any of those things, more protein than your body can use, fat or carbs, it is either going to be oxidized off into the air as heat, or it's going to be feeding muscle or feeding a fat cell. Now, um, I know that the old adage is that all weight loss is predicated on a caloric reduction. That's partially true. I can actually have a person eating more calories and have them losing more weight if they understand the effects of nutrient partitioning. So you can only assimilate, say the average woman can assimilate about 300 calories at one meal. Now let me share with you how much food that would be. It's four to five ounces of grilled chicken breast smothered in pico de gallo with a six ounce baked potato with fat-free Greek yogurt and chives and a cup of grilled asparagus and all that food that I just mentioned, 300 calories. And I will tell you that virtually none of it would feed a fat cell. It would only be partitioned towards muscle and burned as energy. Now, if somebody said to you that you're supposed to eat 1,200 calories a day and you only eat two meals, but you eat 600 calories at each meal, you're gaining weight because your body can only process 300. So you see in this example, what I've noticed is when people eat less meals, in fact, the biggest people I meet are two meal a day eaters because each time they sit down to eat, they can't possibly uh, uh, stay in that level of calories. They overeat because they're hungry and whatnot. Now, your body can only process so many grams of protein, carbs and fat. So if I tell you that your body could use four to five ounces of good quality low fat protein and you eat eight, guess what? The excess protein would be converted to fat. So you see, what I believe in is this. I cannot get an athlete bigger and more muscular by cramming more calories into each feeding. The only way I can get them to be leaner and more muscular is by adding more meals of equal value spread out evenly. Now that girl that was eating 1,200 calories between two meals is getting heavy. She can't lose weight. In fact, her protein requirements are not going to be met because she's only eating protein at two meals and the maximum she can use is, let's say, uh, maybe 50 grams of protein between the two. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have that person have a 300 calorie meal at breakfast, lunch, dinner, mid-morning, mid-afternoon. And you see this person is now eating 1,500 calories a day and actually getting leaner. So at the end of the day, I understand the idea that we all want to have a reduction of calories. But what I would say is a little bit more complicated than that. I want to see my clients understand how many calories their body can assimilate per feeding, because that's the most important thing. If you ask me how many calories should I eat in a day, I'm not having that conversation with anybody. What you should ask me is, how many nutrients and calories can my body assimilate per feeding? So you see, my objective is to use high quality foods that are nutrient dense, and so that the person can be totally full and satisfied and actually eat more food and get less calories. Because you can get two different people doing a 1200 calorie diet and you're gonna get a totally different outcome. Example, I did a consultation, my 600 pound life, Dr. Now. I was asked to help this woman who was 600 pounds. Uh, the reason why they called me in is because she could not lose weight. And she swore to him that she was only doing 1,500 calories. And he didn't believe it, and he wasn't believing it. And so we had a discussion. And in our conversation, what I found out is she'd get up in the morning and she would do 500 calories at lunch, but she was doing 900 or 1,000 calories at dinner eating with the family. 
Now, that is not going to be conducive to weight loss because you can only assimilate a certain amount of calories in a sitting. If you eat a thousand calories one time a day in one sitting, you are not gonna lose weight because what your body can't assimilate, it's gonna be stored into fat. So what, when we discussed eating the 1,200 or 1,500 calories, 300 calories five times a day instead of twice a day, she was able to lose 86 pounds so she could have the surgery. So it's not the amount of calories per day you're eating, it's what are you eating individually, how many calories are you eating at each meal, and to make sure that it's balanced right. How many calories are in a cup of nuts, just a cup of almonds? 825. Do you realize that all nuts are, almost all of them are 80% fat, almost, some are 75, some are 80, but in that range? In other words, if bacon is 62 and I wouldn't munch on that to drop body fat, why would I be munching on nuts? Look, the reality here is that your body can only assimilate so many grams of fat at one time. On the average person, I would say maybe 10 or 12 grams of fat for a female per meal. But look at if you're eating 45, 50 grams of fat at one time, but your body can't process all that, where is it going? It's being, again, stored as fat. Or if you're a fast oxidizer, your body just simply oxidizes the excess calories off into heat. But most people are going to store them. But do you realize that a half a cup of nuts is not a lot? But if you just add a half a cup of raw nuts into your yogurt, you put 410 calories at 80% fat, you just change the whole infrastructure of that meal to go from a weight loss meal into more of a fat storing meal. So while nuts are healthy, I think what people need to realize is there's a huge difference between eating for health versus eating to be lean. They're not the same thing. Some foods that are healthy are good for you, but if you overuse them, it's gonna make it harder for you to get lean. Same thing with nut milks, like almond milk. Look at this label. It's got less than one gram of protein. You do understand there's nothing in that milk that's really feeding a muscle cell. And look at it, the milk is higher in fat than bacon, higher in fat than T-bone steak. Not the fat's the culprit here, but look, if you don't understand what you're doing and you start mixing almond milk and all your protein shakes and you can't lose weight, you gotta start to look at this stuff to see if some adjustments need to be made in this area to help you out. I wanna briefly interrupt here and explain why we should be eating 20% fat or less in our meals. You see, the most important element in losing weight is to never be hungry and to always be full after each meal. So, how can we eat all that food to get full and still lose weight? Well, that's where Keith Klein's 20% fat rule comes in. Since fats are almost twice as calorie dense as protein and carbohydrates, eating more fat leaves far less food to be consumed, which in turn contributes to a greater hunger and loss of control over food. For example, would you rather eat these almonds for roughly 300 calories or this meal, also around 300 calories. And remember, eating that many almonds has way too many fat grams for your body to utilize in one sitting. So guess what? It's storing as fat. Whereas the second meal, which is properly nutritionally balanced, simply cannot feed a fat cell and will keep you full. It's like in anything, if you have a game plan, you're gonna have a game plan for success. And the biggest thing, especially for weight loss, is to pr prepare your meals and you cook them, you prepare them, but having your food prepared for you is a huge, huge benefit, especially on your weight loss journey. That way you're not guessing, you're not starving, you're not panicking, you're like, oh, I haven't eaten, I don't know where to go, and I'll pull over at McDonald's. You know, have, you know formulate a game plan and get your foods prepared. Let me go through the top five things that hold people back from, say, losing weight. Let's just uh, make up five. I eat out too much. I eat too much red meat, I eat too much fried food, I don't exercise, and I don't cook enough. When you look at that list of those five things, is there any one of those five things that stand out to you that if you were to focus the most attention on would change almost all of them? I find that when you make a list of the five things that hold you back, you will discover that if you focus on one, you can change almost all of them. And that list of issues that I just spoke of, those five things, do you realize the one thing that would change almost all of it is if that person started cooking? Because you see, if they cooked their food, they would have food to carry. If they carried their food, they wouldn't eat out as much. If they carried what they're supposed to eat, they have exactly what they're supposed to eat, they wouldn't eat as much red meat or fried food, right? So that one little thing of cooking and carrying food can put a person in major compliance with their stated goal. So people who don't cook and carry are always at the mercy of, of hunger. 
right? The moment you get hungry, it's just give me food now. I don't care what it is I want it. So what's going to happen? You get hungry, you pull into fast food, you eat the wrong things. By preparing your meals, whether it's the weekend, get up in the morning, I throw stuff in Tupperware, I have it with me. So when it's time to eat, it's easy. There's no problems. I don't have to think about what I'm going to eat. It's there. It's convenient. It's to me, it's more of a punishment not to have my food with me and prepared than it is to like go out the door without my food. And so by having it with you and being prepared for the day is going to keep you on track and is going to help you stay on track. Because if you don't do that, you're going to fail. I want people to understand there's really only four factors that influence weight loss. There are no other four that I know of. The first one is it's your food. The second one, it's your exercise. And sometimes it can just be one thing that the person isn't doing. The third thing is drugs. There are certain medications you can be put on, like corticosteroids, that can inflict a massive weight gain with no change in your eating or exercising. And the fourth thing is a hormone. What we've seen over the years when people come in and we design the proper eating protocol, we remeasure their body fat in two weeks. And if they don't change at the rate that I think they should, we immediately turn to blood work up. What's critical to look at in hormones is to look at your thyroglobulin binding antibody. You see, in some people's bodies, their thyroid profile looks pretty good. But what's not seen is the fact that their body is developing antibodies against their own thyroid and locking it up. All right, so what are the hormones that can affect you? Mainly thyroid, prolactin, testosterone, um, hyperestrogenemia, where your estrogen level's too high. Um, and those are the primary things you might want to go get checked if you feel like uh, out of those four components, it's hormones. And here's what's interesting too. This is, this is great. Let's say we take a guy, we'll say a hypothetical guy, 60 years old, never worked out a day in his life, didn't make good food choices. We could have that guy exercising. We could have that guy starting to make good food choices. We could get that guy hormonally optimal. And you know what? In six months, eight months, nine months, one year, he looked like he'd been doing it his whole life. And we could take someone that's been doing it their whole life and they get to 60. For whatever reason, they sort of stop. They don't check their hormones. They don't go to the doctor. They stop eating really good and they stop moving their body. They'll look like they never did it their whole life. So it's easy to make the switch. Yeah, so listen, water is a really critical component of human health. And when you're fully hydrated, that's an anti-inflammatory thing for the body. Um, water cleanses our system. It's the thing that takes the, the bad toxins out of our body and secretes it through our, our urine and feces. So water plays a huge role in our overall health. And so hydration is really important to longevity and health and wellness because not only does it clear the toxins out of our body, it helps prevent injuries. So water really helps with also appetite control. You know, the thing that regulates your appetite, hypothalamus, is the same thing that regulates thirst. And often when we think we're hungry, our hypothalamus is stimulated and really what is is thirsty. So sometimes you'll find if you just drink a glass of water, your hunger diminishes a great deal as well. The amount of water someone should drink, I, the rule of thumb I say is um, half your body. So if I weigh 120 pounds, half my weight, I should be doing 60 ounces. So your weight divided by two is about how much water people should be consuming. And if they're exercising or they're outside, of course that's gonna change. If you work outside in the heat or you know, if you're at the gym and you're sweating, of course that would change. You need to do way more than that. I wake up every day and I have a good, a large, as we say in Boston, a large glass of water. First thing, it's crucial for dieting, it's crucial for life, <laughs> it's crucial for everything. So now that we understand the nutritional part of it, Let's talk about exercise. I know a lot of us think, do I really have to exercise to lose weight? Why can't I just lose weight by dieting alone? Can't I just eat right and skip the gym? I don't want to go into the gym and lift heavy weights like Arnold. Plus, I'm too old now to lift weights. Well, here are the iron facts. We always have the individual be like, I'm just gonna diet, I don't need the gym. Gym's not for me, I don't need to exercise, I'm just gonna die. Well, I'll tell you what, that person is not gonna do too well. You know what I mean? Because your body, your body needs exercise. Even the government these days, they have literature now about lack of exercise is worse than smoking like, I don't know how many packs of cigarettes a day. That's how bad lack of exercise is for you. So besides the food they eat, it is important for people to exercise because there's so many things that happen. One, exercise is, caused the, is called the number one antidepressant. 
drug, I guess. Because when you exercise, you make different endorphins. It changes the brain chemistry, which is huge. People that have been depressed and had anxiety, exercise has made a difference. It's great for stress reduction. People that are making cortisol all day long and, and they're stressed at work, exercising actually calms the brain, calms them, helps with cortisol. Um, and then on top of that, when you exercise, you're burning calories. Like every time you're taking a step on the treadmill, your muscles are contracting. When those muscles are contracting, you're using glucose, meaning you're using calories. So really to have success faster and also to even look better by combining the meal plan with the exercise, that is a win-win because the other JAMA just came out with a article, but what it said is that low fitness is worse than people that have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, everything. Low fitness in the long run is worse than having, you know, even if these people had their blood work was great and they had low fitness, they were gonna be worse off for people that had terrible blood work, but they did exercise. So low fitness overall is worse. And when you work out, it's anti-aging. Chuck Dirtinger earned his master's degree in science with a specialization in exercise physiology. Over the years, Chuck has coached over a thousand people on how to move through the process of self-change. He is an expert on the acute responses and chronic adaptations to exercise. In the past, he worked with Labrada Nutrition and is currently a coach as well as a training director for the entire staff for the online program Lean Body Coaching. If you had any questions about the real, scientific effect exercise has on the body, Chuck has the answers. The reason why exercise is uh, so good to implement with a good nutrition plan is because the physical activity of using your muscles triggers things in your body that actually upregulate nutrients. So you're burning more calories, of course, but it's actually the afterburn that comes into effect too. So when you work out really hard, let's say you go on an elliptical machine, you burn 300 calories and you're doing something like a high intensity interval training protocol, like you know the hills on the machine or something. If you're doing that and you're burning those extra calories while you're exercising, maybe that's 300, let's say, right, in 30 minutes or so, you're going to actually have an afterburn too. So all of that exercise is not only going to burn calories, but it's actually going to signal things in your body to help regenerate and recuperate muscle tissue, which is anabolic. It means that it is energy using, if you will. So when we have things that are energy using and we stimulate them, it means that we'll be able to burn more energy. When you eat those healthy foods, you're going to be able to lose excess body mass that much faster. You know, as I mentioned earlier, when you have more muscle, you have a faster metabolism, right? And so one thing is, if you have a slow metabolism, you can actually pick it up by engaging in more cardiovascular activity and weight training. So just because you're starting off with a slow metabolism does not mean that you can't increase your metabolism through diet and exercise. Because remember, so for every pound of muscle that you have, you have to eat 17 calories just to sustain it or thereabouts. And for every pound of fat you have, you only have to eat five calories to sustain it because all your body's gonna do is send blood to keep it alive. Now remember, if you drop 10 pounds of fat and you gave five pounds of muscle, well that five pounds times 17 calories just increased your metabolic rate and you pulled off all that excess fat which didn't require that many calories to begin with. So you can actually increase your metabolic rate by increasing muscle. And I really see a lot of people increase their metabolic rate by getting back to some cardiovascular activity. Because I do think it helps to level out hormones. Uh, it just does an amazing job on helping people's heart rate and circulation of blood. Remember, if your blood's circulating more, your metabolic rate's higher. Nutrition's first and foremost, in my opinion, then we add exercise. And then there's a difference between cardio and resistance training. A lot of people might get on a, a treadmill because it's familiar or a, or a elliptical or a bike or a Stairmaster and they focus just on that and they want to try and burn calories. Um, each machine you know, obviously activates muscles a little bit differently, but for all intents and purposes, let's say a general treadmill, right? You can walk on it, run on it. By doing only cardiovascular exercise, you're really focusing on um, your heart health. And that's really, really important. However, you're not able to stimulate the muscle tissue in a, in a stressful sense that triggers adaptation, if you will. So what I mean by that is, when you're jogging, you're gonna take hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands of steps. Whereas if you were to do a lunge and holding onto a dumbbell, you might only do 
14 or 15 steps and you'd be exhausted, right? So the purpose is by putting the muscle under a more strenuous environment, it's going to have different adaptations to it. And those adaptations are growth and definition and density. Uh, you know, all those people want the nice curves and shapes. Well, that's muscle. Not only that, <laughs> resistance training has so many other abundant benefits to bone density increases, to ligament health, to tendons, uh, longevity and mobility as we age. So resistance training is definitely a big plus. Well, exercise, we have such a large body of work that shows conclusively that exercise can increase your longevity factors. It really reverses the aging process. I've seen people who literally look 60 years old, but they start working out, building muscle, eating right, and I mean, it looks like they knocked 10 years off their life. So exercise, one of the things that happens as we become sedentary is we don't have as much blood flow going, right? The circulatory system slows down. When you just go out and jog a little bit, power walk a little bit, lift some weights, you really get your blood recirculating. And you know, when we lose muscle, we don't just lose the big ones, we also lose the little ones that keep the skeletal system in place. So when you exercise, those little ones, those little muscles that hold your skeletal system in place can stay strengthened. When you don't exercise, they atrophy just like the big muscles. And this is why so many people say in their 60s or 70s or 80s, fall over in the shower, break their hip, hit their head on a counter and pass away. Because eventually they lose the stability uh, of what those little muscles create for you. And as they atrophy, your skeletal system becomes very unstable. And how many times do we see an older gentleman walking with more of a shuffled gait rather than actually taking steps? That is not, by the way, a natural act of aging. What you're seeing when somebody begins shuffling is actually a result of a lack of weight-bearing exercise over time as they aged. And again, we talked about people who just think, all right, my exercise is cardio, which is great, you know what I mean? But I think in your formative years, you need muscle, you need strength. And how you get that is through weight training. And we talked about weight training is gonna, it's gonna strengthen your skeletal structure, and you need that. I mean, you don't wanna be a frail old person. And sadly enough, even people 50, 60, 70 years, 50, actually 40s, 50s are getting hip replacements now because they neglected the weight training. And they're like, oh, I'll run, I'll run, I'll run. Running's great, but I think everyone should engage in weight training. I think it's so, it's so beneficial to you. I just believe that to have a, a overall good for you program, it's gotta include exercise. It, it has to. Uh, it's, it's a huge component. Nothing will strengthen your bones, build your muscles, contour your body, and give you the shape and tone like resistance exercise. That's weights. Resistance exercise is weights. And then your choices could be endless. Whatever you sort of tend to gravitate to, whatever you tend to do most often, whatever you tend to crave and want to do. Now, one thing about working out that many people don't know, especially for anti-aging, um, Tufts University came out with a study, and it says when you age, there's these different milestones that can happen to every single one of us. When we age, we lose muscle mass, we lose strength, you know, we start putting on more body fat, our metabolism slows down, uh, bad cholesterol goes up, good cholesterol goes down, you start having problems with temperature regulation, but there's 10 points. All these things happen as we age, but there's one thing that can reverse all of that. And what do you think it is? It's exercise. Exercise as in lifting weights and doing some cardiovascular work, the combination of the both is going to be anti-aging and it's going to slow down or prevent or even reverse some of those milestones people might already be having. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a million benefits to weight training and exercise and eating right, whether it's, you know, become combating heart disease, combating cancer, combating all the, all the horrible life's disastrous diseases to prolonging your life, to healthy life. But here's one thing about weight training that a lot of people don't know. What the science says, your body can be burning fat efficiently up for, you know, two, three, four hours later, which is, it's unfathomable. It's like, I mean, I just train so hard and my body's still burning fat. That's amazing. So you, there's a lot of things that are, are not measured, but you get better responses and better results by doing. So people look on the machines all the time. They say, oh, I burn 200 calories, 500 calories. And first of all, those machines aren't accurate for many reasons, um, because it's really just taking your weight and your age. But what it's not taking into consideration, what's your body comp? Like say I'm 120 pounds and I probably have more lean muscle mass than another 120 pound 
young girl next to me. And if we're both walking on the treadmill, the more muscle mass you have, every step I'm, I have more muscle that's burning calories. So I am using more calories than someone else that has maybe more fat and less muscle. So it really isn't about your height and your weight when you're doing these things. So that's not accurate. But when you leave the gym, your body's still recovering. It's when you work out for several hours, your body is still burning calories from that workout. It's not like when you leave the gym, it's over. Of course, with all things, overtraining is detrimental to, especially when it comes to physique development. Unlike, it's funny, like training for yourself is unlike any other sport. If you're golfing, you can golf for five, six hours to perfect your swing. If you're surfing, you need to be in the ocean four or five hours just to get out there to catch the wave. But when it comes to your body, and, sci and there's science behind this, your body can only sustain 60 to 90 minutes of vigorous activity. After that, it's such a shutdown, and the damage is, is probably too overwhelming. I mean, it leads to injuries, it leads to aches, it leads to pains, it leads to chronic, chronic pain that can happen. So. If you're in the gym three, four, or five hours a day, you'd better be working there. Because if not, you, you're just killing yourself. It's like this. If you really want to mess your body up and mess your hormone system up, do excessive cardio. Excessive. Talk to any triathlete, any cyclist. That takes its toll on the body. And so, again, what's the goal? If the goal, you know, if, if, if it's a requirement, for your chosen occupation or sport, you sort of don't have much of a choice. But if your goal is just to get fit, it doesn't require more than an hour five times a week. Uh, my weight was at 150 pounds when I started my bicycle journey. I was averaging eight to 10 hours a day cycling. And not just cycling, I'm balancing on the rear wheel. So you're using the whole body, upper body, lower body, everything you can think of, I'm using it. And so I noticed I started shrinking as I was going into my ride and I was consuming and consuming and consuming. Um, I was up to 4,000 calories a day. For someone my stature, that's a lot of calories. And I was still losing weight. When I finished the cross, the finish line, I was skin and bones. I weighed 130 pounds. I lost 20 pounds of muscle mass. It was ridiculous. Um, it's been three months now since my ride. I'm almost back to my normal weight. It took me that long to get back to where I want to be. My strength still isn't there yet. I'm still progressing. There's a point when um, people, they start exercising and they think, oh, this is great. And they want to exercise more. Think of, well, they would get faster results. Well, there's a, there's something called overtraining and it does several things. One, it can actually increase your cortisol. I know many times when me, other athletes have overtrained, what you start seeing, you start putting on more fat. Because when you overtrain, you need time for your muscles to recover. You know, every body part I say, whatever body part you're doing, give it at least 48 hours to rest, sometimes 72 hours, depending how hard you lift. Because if you don't give it that recovery, it's not going to recover. And if you start working out on muscles that are already fatigued, you're basically gonna break them down. So now you're burning muscle and you're storing fat, then trying to build muscle and, and get rid of fat. I would ideally suggest that your exercise program have a combination of resistance, a little bit of aerobic cardio, something that's fun, whether it's going to the dog park with your dog or playing with kids or grandkids. There needs to be some sort of active rest, I would call it, things that you would do that, whether it's in the garden or out by the pool or things that you don't even view as exercise, but lifting weights two, three times a week for 30 to 40 minutes and some form of cardio and a little bit of flexibility training. Now, we come to what I believe is the most important part of any weight loss journey, and it's an element that most weight loss systems do not include, the psychology of weight loss. Without it, no sustainable weight loss is possible. Many companies will mail you food or teach you how to eat, but not show you the reasons behind our overeating or show us how to control all those cravings. As you will see, you cannot change the body without changing the mindset first. Once you master your mind, all you have to do is just wait for your body to catch up.
So a number of years ago, I was working with a psychiatrist, and as all we did was work with eating disorder patients. And back in those days, they were very formidable for me because one of the things that it, it did is it allowed me to really sit back and see the psychological component of weight loss just versus the food component. And during those years working with a psychiatrist, we were having great, really great conversations about how that person's thought process was interfering with their ability to get where they wanted to go. And one of the things I was doing back in those days is I started writing papers uh, for a lot of articles and journals and things like that. And one of them I labeled as the psychology of deprivation. So what I want to show you is how a simple thought, like you know, the beginning of a diet, eat perfectly, you know, no more red meat, no more fried food, can actually turn out to work against you. And you see a lot of dieters go through this, and their intentions are really good. So the way they start out is they start off with, okay, I'm gonna do perfect, no more red meat, no more fried food, no more eating out, and they start their diet. I'm gonna tell you that's gonna last about two weeks. It rarely ever goes beyond two months because that seems to be the snapping moment where everybody breaks, okay? Now, as you're giving up all your favorite foods, you're gonna to start to get struck by all the cravings for the foods you haven't been allowed to eat. The first thing you're gonna do when the cravings strike is resist, and the way we resist the cravings is we say no to them. Now, you say no, and that's gonna last about as long as the moment you encounter the trigger. The trigger's a negative emotional state. So you kept resisting the foods, and all of a sudden one day you get frustrated, you get angry, you get bored, whatever that is, it's over, and now you binge on the foods you said you wouldn't eat anymore. Now the moment you binge on those foods, you gotta realize that person just violated all the rules and guidelines they laid out to begin with, which was to eat perfectly. So out of that binge then originates guilt. We feel bad because we just violated those rules and guidelines. And out of the guilt comes rationalization and justification that sort of sounds like this. Well, I've blown it now, I might as well really blow it, so what the heck? And then off they go completely. Now, as you watch that scenario, I want to create another scenario, because consider this. If you were driving down the road and you got a flat tire, would you ever jump out of your car and slip the other three tires? I mean, who would do that? Look what you just did. You delayed your journey. It's gonna cost you more money. You don't have to buy one tire, you have to buy four. And everything you did in your attempt to get to your destination was destroyed by getting out of your car and slitting the other three tires. So what I wanted to do was teach people that using that statement, I've blown it now, I might as well really blow it, will take you down a path of making it worse. No different than slitting the other three tires, right? But you see, if you're on a sustainable program that you can do the rest of your life, it has to account for momentary lapses because that's gonna happen to all of us, weddings, celebrations, funerals, whatever. And I want you to know that that happens to all of us, but if you will change that word or statement from I've blown it now, I might as well really blow it to if I just don't slit the other three tires, I'm doing great. That takes your brain right back on track and you negate all that extra eating. And so now there's really no damage from that momentary lapse. So many people, they go through this journey and they're doing great. And you know they're very convicted about doing everything right and they're doing great. And then all of a sudden something happens. Um, maybe they are a little bit late on their meal and they get a whiff of something and they're like, or they see something, they hear something on the radio, see something on the television screen as they're walking out, you know, to get in the car and they see something that just stimulates that, oh, that looks so good. Um, and then they want it. And you know what? They go and they eat it. And then that guilt hits them. And they're like, oh, I screwed up. Well, you know what? I screwed up. <laughs> now they're totally off their plan. Now they're going home. And, and what I say to those people, you know what? There's going to be times that's going to happen. But you know what? Three hours later, you have another meal. Pick it up from there. You know, just that one little, I call it little speed bump, little blip in the road is not going to cause you to fail. So yeah, you you messed up, maybe. And I mean, I don't think it's a really a mess up, but you, you fell off your plan, you're guilty about it, but that doesn't mean now all the way until Monday, what is the deal about people starting on Monday? If this happened on Thursday, they're gonna screw up all the way until Monday. Oh, Monday, I'm gonna start again. <laughs> That's not what you wanna do. If you do have a little hiccup, then make your next meal good and then keep going from there. And that way you're gonna continue with progress on your plan. So one of the things I've seen in this practice is that there seems to be a process of change that people go through. And I kinda of wanna walk you through what those different steps are. And what you notice is that almost all the successful people that lose weight and keep it off tend to follow this particular path of steps unsuccessful people, I watch what they do, and there's really no mystery as to why they're unsuccessful. They're often trying to bypass these steps. Um, the first step that you watch somebody go through is called awareness, right? The person becomes acutely aware that what they've been doing is no longer working for them. Um, so 
whatever that thing is, something somebody said, they try on a new pair of clothing, they can't get into it, right? They become acutely aware that what they've been doing is no longer working, and that's the first step that begins the change. The problem with it, though, is awareness is not enough to change. Because how many people do we know um, that know they have a drinking problem, a cigarette smoke problem, or a weight problem, and never change it? Okay, but awareness is the first step that starts the journey. The second step, which I will tell you is very, very important, and you can't skip this one, is contemplation. Contemplation is where you sit down before you start your journey, and you kind of sit down and ask yourself, how is this journey going to go with the way my life is, right? Is this going to be more fun or is it going to be less fun? Um, how am I going to work this into my socializing and my setting, right? I think you need to spend a little time contemplating how you see putting this change into action. Now, once again, the problem with contemplation is it's, it, 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 it isn't permanent. It becomes procrastination sometimes for some people, right? So you don't want to stay in contemplation too long, but when it becomes procrastination, how many people do we know that are talking about changing all the time but never do? But I do think the second step is you got to think about how you're going to incorporate this into your life and how you're going to work around it, right? Then, and this is critical, the next step is knowledge. I would say the biggest problem for most people is they take in the wrong knowledge, right? They read some stupid diet book, uh, it's radical, it's, it's crazy, right? I don't know, cut out all your carbs. And those things, that kind of knowledge is going to set you up to fail because if the knowledge you take in is defective, every step you take after that is only going to lead to failure. So what we try to do is make sure that you're given the right knowledge, the right information about how to change for you. Now, that's not the end of it, right? So what happens next is the person takes action. They take the knowledge they're learning, they start implementing it into action, and then they can experiment with it along the way and make adjustments. Now, most people think that once you get to action, it's over, it's done, but honestly, on average, what I've seen in this business is that most people on average go from action back to contemplation, you know, one, two, three, four, five times before they finally finish the cycle. Because you see, when you go from action back to contemplation, that's telling you there's something you didn't learn in the knowledge that you got to go back and learn, right? And so most people, though, when they fall out of action, they think they failed. It's over, and now they're on to the next diet. When if you took in the right information and you failed, it's probably because there's some components of your lifestyle you haven't worked this into, and you have to figure that out. Now, once you move into action, the goal of all clinicians is to get you to the final stage, which is the one I call self-accountability. When you reach that final stage, your change is permanent, it's part of you, it's part of your essence. You would do it even if you went on vacation because it's what you want to do, it's not what you have to do. There is a gigantic difference between want to versus have to. So long as a change is put under the category of a have to, you won't keep doing it. Right? When it's under a want to, you'll keep doing it. What I would like to convey to people that feel hopeless is that there is hope. And it's really encouraging people that, listen, today, maybe today, just today, how about just add one healthy meal? Just add a healthy meal to your current program. Maybe tomorrow, add a healthy meal, take a 10 minute walk. Day three, let's Add two healthy meals to your current program. Go on a 15-minute walk. Do some muscle-building exercises, maybe in the privacy of your own home. And over time, these things add up. So while I was working with a psychiatrist, what I had to do was uh, try to help people reintroduce foods that are considered bad foods into their program so that we could come back to a program of eating management, not deprivation, rigid omissions and guidelines, right? So I came up with a statement, which I actually trademarked years ago, called Better Bad Choices. And what I was trying to do was show people that you do not have to eat perfectly to get a massive change in your weight. What you have to do is you simply need to do better. So consider this. If I sit down in front of somebody and I notice they've been eating red meat four or five days a week, my question to them would be, what do you honestly believe that you could cut it back to and you could live with? Now, if that person said, well, I could eat red meat twice a week, I'd say, great, that's a change to make. Because when you go from red meat four or five days a week to twice, aren't you doing better? Now, what's interesting about this is the patient doesn't notice anything. 
you know, they're not deprived, they're still having red meat, they just chose to adjust it back to a more reasonable level. And that one small change would actually create great results over the course of time because it's sustainable. See, so whenever you approach a meal, you just ask yourself, how can I make this a better bad choice? And what I came up with is I believe there's three different sustainable ways of people making a better bad choice. The first, make a more positive food selection. So if you can find a more positive food selection like lower fat, lower calorie ice cream that you enjoy eating, switch to that. The second way you make a better bad choice is by not doing something as often as you used to. So again, like I said, if I was doing the red meat five days a week and now I cut it back to two, so long as that's sustainable, I'm gonna get great results. What I would also do though, is change the amount. So that's the third way. If I always have a 12 ounce T-bone, can I get away with an eight? Now you're not giving up anything. The idea of better bad choices was to show people that no one has to eat perfectly to lose weight. You simply have to start doing better. And don't get rid of those foods you love. My suggestion here is just don't do it as often. So I'm never gonna to say to somebody you can't have hamburger and fries. But again, if they were doing that twice a week and now they do it once every two weeks, aren't they doing better? Finally, we come to another important element in fat loss, motivation. When we start a program, it feels like we can conquer the world. We are super motivated and really gung-ho. Then life happens and things get in the way and we seem to lose that fire that was inside us. How do we keep that motivation going throughout the whole transformation journey? And when we lose it and get lost, how can we rediscover that joy, that passion? You know, the subject of motivation and inspiration is rather interesting to me. I'm gonna share a story with you, if I may. So in my very early 20s, late teens, I was working hard. I was selling shoes at a department store. I was bouncing in bars in the evening. And I actually had a few people that I would try to encourage in the gym, friends and family and people that I'd met in the gym. But I also had keys to the gym. And I would be in the gym in the four o'clock hour, 4 a.m. So one time I'm just trying to get a little bit of a nap. I didn't sleep much in those younger days. And I kid you not, this is a hardcore bodybuilding gym and a guy walks in the gym. I'm the only one in the gym. I'm the only one that sees him. He had to have been close to 400 pounds. He doesn't even know that I see him. He comes in the gym, he looks around, he walks out. It's still dark outside. I don't know why. I don't know why, but I chased him. I scared him, didn't mean to scare him. I was a big, you know, teenage kid. I said, excuse me, it, it, can I help you? He goes, no, you can't. There is no help for me. There's no hope for me. I joined this gym. I walked in, I can't, I can't do it. I said, let me tell you something, sir. Just showing up is 90% of the battle. Just showing up, you showed up today. I said, come back in. I'm, I'm gonna take you through a workout. I wasn't a trainer, that wasn't my profession. And I said, listen, I'll make a deal with you. I'll train you for 90 days, but if you miss one time, we're done. 90 days goes by, this guy's lost like 30, 40 pounds. Now he's inspired because he's seeing results. A year goes by, he ends up losing about 100 pounds and you could see the life change. The transformation is starting. But what it started for me was his answer to a question. I said, Bob, why did you never quit? You know, most people, that big, don't stick to diets, don't make good food choices, they don't stick to a gym like this. He said, Larry, the truth is I never wanted to disappoint you. He goes, you have inspired me. And at that moment in time, I realized that the, one of the greatest gifts that a person could be bestowed upon themselves is the ability to inspire other people. So the other thing I've noticed in my clinical practice is there seems to be three different levels of motivation that we try to strive and get our, our clients through. What initiates a change is what I call fear-based motivation. It's a great motivator, by the way. At the beginning, it can motivate a lot of people. I mean, you go to your doctor and he says, hey, you're a type two diabetic, or your doctor says, my God, your cholesterol's so high, you're gonna have a heart attack or a stroke. And that fear generates action on the part of the individual, and it can be very motivational. The problem with fear-based motivation is it is not long-lasting, right? Because once you take action, you resolve fear. 
And if your motivation was based solely on the fear and the fear is no longer present, guess where you're gonna go? Right back to your old behaviors. You're gonna recreate the problem. Now your cholesterol gets high again, now your type two diabetes returns. The goal then is to move from the first form of motivation to the second. And the second is what I call feedback-based motivation. It's very powerful. I've seen people stay in feedback motivation for years and years and years. And feedback motivation is a wonderful form of motivation because you're getting all of the feedback from the world around you. Friends are coming up going, oh my God, I've never seen you look this good. What are you doing? Um, the scale tells you it's better. Uh, the body fat's going down. Your clothes are fitting looser. And all of this feedback lends itself to a higher level of motivation to keep going. Now, the problem with feedback-based motivation is it can't last forever. Because look, what's gonna happen when the feedback starts to trail off? And what happens is what's gonna happen when you reach your goal? The clothes can't get any looser, the scale can't get any lower, people aren't commenting on it anymore. In that moment, if you can reach the third level, and here's what's fascinating about this. The first two levels of motivation, your clinician can create for you, right? What I've discovered is there is no way I can put anybody in the third level. I, ju I just can't do it. And uh, it's become very clear to me that the third level is an intrinsic level of change and motivation. And what happens is the motivation to do this goes from the outside to the inside, where the person just now sees this as the new them. It's what they want to do, it's not what they have to do. And when somebody's in that third level, where it truly is intrinsic, and it's an intrinsic level of motivation that they really, really uh, has become part of them, you'll watch when this person goes on vacation, they still want to eat clean, they still go to the gym, they still work out, because it's not a have to. And so you see, when that person reaches the third level, it's the most dynamic thing I see in my clinical practice, because I love it when they reach that. And these are the people that have kept the weight off 10, 15, or 20 years. I get this all the time. I'm 53 years old, and people say, the f are you motivated all day long? And I use everything in the world from imagery. I love, I, I think pictures are amazing. I think it's, it captures in our raw essence. It's like, okay, this is what I look like now. Boy, do I need some work. This is what I want to look like. I, I take pictures of, even to this day, I'll, I'll find pictures of like an early Arnold Schwarzenegger or someone that really inspires me. And I'm just like, and I'll put it on my phone. I'll be like, yeah, I got to work hard today. That's what I want to do. And it gets us constantly focused. I, one of the best tricks I, I, I do when I engage with clients, I'm like, give me your worst picture. Give it to me and I'm going to text it to you when you least expect it. You know what I mean? So that people are like, hey, I'm feeling good, I'm feeling good. I'm not gonna do cardio today. If I know they don't show up, I'm gonna send them their picture. So I constantly try to motivate. I think using visualizations, it's, it's great. And also what I like to do is, um, I'm a gym guy. So I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I'm a Gold's Gym, Venice. I try and find guys that think they're, they're pretty strong and pretty rugged, I'll train with them. I just wanna eat their energy. You know what I mean? I just wanna devour them. I wanna eat their weights, I wanna eat their energy. So I thrive off all the energy in, in a good gym. So, and a lot of people, when they train by themselves, find something that's going to motivate you. What, what, turned, what, what turned your gears in your formative years? Did you play sports? Did you have that one race that you won? You know, think back to the highlights of your life and, and, and reflect and go, man, that was a good time. And bring that energy to you to the gym. But also, too, life sometimes gets in the way. So, so you, you could be inspired one moment, but then all of a sudden the reality of life can just sort of slap you in the face. So you have to be persistent and persevere. So I tell even my, my millennial kids, I tell my employees, I tell everybody, there's, if you wanna be successful in anything, I don't care if it's a police officer, a fireman, weight reduction, you name it, you show up early, you leave late, you volunteer for as much as you can, no matter how busy you think you are. And there's three Ps, persistence, perseverance, and passion. And if you can master those three Ps, you pick your subject. I don't care what it is. Pick your career, pick your occupation, teacher. You'll be successful. If your why is really strong, Every day you getting up to go exercise or whatever it is, is gonna be so much easier because your why you, you, is, is very important. When your why is just because you wanna do it with your friend because it'd be fun, that's when it's gonna get hard. That's when you're gonna miss days, you're gonna like waffle a little bit on your plan. And probably something very beneficial is for people to have support groups. That's real important because there's many times 
Um, in the past, when I was working out, I would you know, getting up in the morning working out. I didn't want to because I knew someone was going to be there. That accountability, I just I, if I didn't show, I knew it was going to be terrible. So that helped. And I see with many other people the support group of someone either exercising with you, whether you need to go walk in the morning, or you go to the gym, or whatever, go to yoga, whatever you choose to do. If you do it with someone, it's better. And if you have everyone on board with you to help you because sometimes you're around people that really aren't supporting you it's really easy for you to do what they're doing but when you do have a support group and they're helping you they're going to help you be successful they're going to do whatever they need to do to make sure you're eating the right foods that you are getting your exercise in and that they're kind of just supporting you and, and telling you how great you're doing and trying to keep you going to that finish line motivation that can come from so many different ways um, i'll put it to where it really hit home with me, progression. So uh, if, you, if you get progress, if you try something, I don't care what it is, whether you're trying to learn Spanish or whether you're trying to play the piano or whether you're trying to lose weight or whether you're trying to get strong, progression. And if you keep doing it and you see progress and you go, wait a second, you know what? Those, those pants fit a little better now. You're gonna wanna keep doing it, right? It's simple, okay? So pro uh, progression, if you see progression, that's my motivation, okay? Some people, uh, they have a, a, a visual board, okay? Like manifesting, they have a board and they can have a picture of a, I don't know, a bodybuilder and say, I wanna look like that. That's another good way. First thing when you wake up in the morning, look at your visual board and say, I want that. And you work towards that goal. Look at it again right before you go to bed. I do that a lot. I have my own visual boards. I go to the extreme, instead of a visual board, I actually put the actual item that I want to try to achieve, uh, like my bicycle. I put my bicycle, it sat in my living room. When I woke up in the morning, it's the first thing I saw. And that's what drove me to keep going. Another thing that I realize that helps people a lot is to keep the value of their goal at the forefront of their brain. You know, what I've noticed over time is that when people lose a certain amount of weight, they kind of get comfortable. I'll never forget a guy that came into my clinic who comes in, sits down, and he, I said, how are you doing? And he goes, I'm doing great, but I find I'm not as focused as I was when I first started. And I said, I, I don't know what that means. Tell me a little bit about what you mean by being focused. He goes, well, you know, Keith, when I first came in, I wasn't drinking alcohol, I wasn't eating out, I wasn't missing workouts, and I wasn't missing meals, I was cooking my own food. He said, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm drinking a little bit here or there, I'm kind of skipping some meals at times, but, and he stands up and undoes his belt, takes his pants and holds it out to here and goes, but check this out. I haven't been in these pants since college. And then he cinched up his belt and sat back down and I realized, I said, you do understand, you just explained to me why you lost your focus. And he said, no, what did I say? And I said, the moment you stood up and you undid your belt, what you just told me is you're comfortable. What you need to understand is people don't change the things they're comfortable with. They only change the things they're uncomfortable with. When you first came into me and you've lost 35 pounds, right? You were uncomfortable, it was painful to have that weight. Now that you've lost 35 pounds, my suggestion to you is to get rid of that pair of pants, uh, punch some holes in your belt, get a new pair of pants that's a little bit snug because you need to get as uncomfortable with the next 20 pounds as you were with the first 35. You see, once he became comfortable, right? He started to lose his focus. And what has to happen is you have to keep the goal at the forefront of your brain to stay motivated. You know, the, the number one thing I could say to people, if you want to lose weight, one thing out of all this nonsense out of, you hear, one thing, determination. If you have determined, if you're determined to do it, you will make it happen. Okay. That means it's a priority to you. Nothing else matters but that. If you stick to that, it will happen. Okay. You may fail sometimes but failing's good failing means you learn if you can learn from that failure and go okay that didn't work so i need to change this and let's go down this path that's how you use applied knowledge i know i threw a lot of information out at you so let's do a quick recap of the real sustainable and healthy way to lose fat there are many great tips in this film but here's a quick top 10. Tip one, eat good healthy foods. If it was made by nature, eat it. If it was made by man, it's mainly processed, so skip it. Tip two, eat the correct combination of foods. Eat a protein, a carb, a veggie at each meal. 
This prevents the insulin spikes that stores fat. Tip three, portion size. Make sure you're using nutrition partitioning and eating the correct amount of calories per meal, not per day. And make sure your fat consumption per meal is less than 20%. Tip four, make sure you spread out your meals every three hours and have five to six meals per day. This keeps that metabolism fire burning hot all day long. Tip five, drink your water. Drink half your body weight in ounces. For instance, a 200 pound person drinks 100 ounces a day. Tip six, don't let a lapse turn into a relapse. If you mess up, get right back on track. Don't beat yourself up about it and make your next meal a good one. Tip seven, find a community of similar minded people to help you, motivate you, and keep you accountable. Harvard did a study and people who lost weight in a group setting lost 225% more weight than those who did it alone. Tip eight, make it a lifestyle change. Do something that you can stick with for the rest of your life. You don't have to eat perfect all the time. Remember what Keith Klein said, small changes over a long period of time create massive results. Tip nine, include an exercise routine into your weight loss journey. Make sure it includes cardio and weightlifting activities. Remember, building muscle raises your metabolism and will help keep you strong and mobile later in life. And finally, tip 10, cook and carry your food. After you plan out your meals, cook them and put them in food containers and carry them with you wherever you go. Nowadays, they make great food coolers, which you can find online. That way, no matter what happens that day, you will be prepared and have exactly what you need to eat. As you can imagine, there was so much information, I couldn't fit it all in just one movie. So, I'm working on Beyond Weight Loss 2. Of course, in this movie, I'll show you more amazing tips and tricks to lose weight that were on the cutting room floor. But, we will talk to many more successful people and hear their inspirational stories and we go undercover and have an explosive expose that the diet world never wants you to see. Stay tuned. You know, it's interesting. Um, getting close to 60 and I probably am better shape than I was in my 20s and 30s and I competed in bodybuilding and I've been in the gym business since I'm a teenager. So age, they say, is just a number, but I will tell you this. I feel that, that we are always in this quest to stay younger, longer, and I think science, biology, you know, technology, we're gonna be able to stay younger and fitter and more vibrant a lot longer than ever before, so I love it. And here's the neatest thing, and I tell everyone this, it's like you're banging your head against the wall, you're banging your head against the wall, and you're like, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. Then you're gonna wake up, and 99% of the time you're gonna wake up, and it happens with everyone, you're gonna be like, it just happens. You wake up and all of a sudden, oh my God, there I am. This is the body I wanted. I can finally see exactly where you're going. And when you start seeing, you know, like abs coming in, like vascularity come in, that's motivating, that's super exciting. Everyone gets excited, and I just tell everyone, you have to be patient, because it's a process. 